Hey guys, thanks for watching. Today I've brought back Leanne, who we interviewed previously, to talk about specifically resumes, interviewing, contracts, and negotiations. Now this is gonna be a three-part series. This is the first part. Today we're talking about resumes. Resumes for PA school, resumes for PA jobs, what you should include, what you shouldn't include, how to go about it, how to format it, all the little things that will make you stand out and make sure that you get that position. I'm Savannah, I'm a dermatology PA, I run the PA platform. Thank you so, so much for watching and let's get to it. Okay, all right, so, uh, hey guys, my name's Leanne, I'm a physician assistant. Um, I work for a company that I own called Advanced Practice Provider Solutions, uh, conjointly with my husband who is an attorney and we present to different PA programs, particularly uh, ones that have new graduates that are about to go out into the real working world and talk to them about resumes, interviews, contracts, and negotiations. Um, if you're interested more in this or want to contact me, you can check out my website at advancedpracticeproviderssolutions.com. Uh, the spelling and logo is down there at the bottom right of this presentation if you want to reference back to that in the future, but we'll get started. Um, so the first section that I talk about is resumes. Um, and just to give you a little background information of, of who I am, um, I have a bachelor's of science in biology, went to Arizona State University, and I got my physician assistant studies master at uh, AT Still University in Mesa, Arizona, and I'm currently finishing my healthcare administration degree through University of Phoenix. Um, I've been a practicing PA for about four and a half years, going on five years right now, and uh, my husband has been a practicing attorney for about seven years. And so combined, we kind of put together some really important information for PAs. If you want to learn more about me separately and what I do, that's my website and that's his website. So um, some really basic tips that I think uh, I like to drive home first is the importance of doing your resume as a Word document and as a PDF. Um, Oftentimes, I see that people are sending their resumes as a Word doc, whether they're uploading it that way or they're emailing it to recruiters or different employers in that format. And you really can't predict what type of computer or software system that somebody else has. And so oftentimes, the formatting comes through really bad. And so it's really best to do it as a PDF. So if I open it up from my cell phone, my laptop, whether it's a PC or a Mac, or a tablet or whatever it is that the format always comes out the same and you don't have to worry about it coming through jumbled or somebody not having that font on their computer um, so that you avoid issues that way. Word documents really should just be used for the purposes of you keeping it on your own and editing it and PDF is for sending out finalized versions. So other than that, I say that for new graduates, they really need to make their resume one page or less and there are outstanding circumstances where maybe somebody would have more than one page, but I do find that that's very rare. And when you only have maybe 15 seconds to make an impression with somebody, you really need to get straight to the point with the information that's on your resume and cut out all of the fluff. A lot of people really like to do these creative, elaborate resumes with lots of language and words and details about the things that they did. But in all reality, uh, we really need to cut back on that and focus on what's important so that you can land the job interview. Uh, don't use risky fronts. We wanna keep things that people can read that are legible, uh, don't worry about it being pretty, just worry about people being able to read it. Uh, you do wanna make it aesthetically pleasing, however, I think having good organization and formatting is important to having the reader be able to follow the information nicely through the page. Um, also, you kinda have to decide whether or not you wanna include we definitely need a cover letter. I don't know that it's completely necessary as a new graduate, uh, but especially as you move on through your career, if you're going from one specialty to another or you have special circumstances, a cover letter can really help you stand out. And um, I do get a lot of questions about whether or not a headshot should be included on a cover letter. I think it's a controversial issue. Um, if you're asking me personally, I think you should have a headshot on your cover letter, not on your resume. I think that it sets you apart from other people. I think that uh, I have an interesting way of thinking about this. I, I think of our target market as men because most doctors are males, right? So as a female dominated profession, that's mostly, you know, PAs are females. And although we do have some males, uh, I think unconsciously we have a lot of doctors that uh, take first impressions off of the pictures that we send them, uh, whether they're male or female. I think anybody just off of a photo sometimes can 
make a first impression. And these people may be just unconsciously looking at your photo and picturing you as somebody working in their office or decide to bring you into an interview just based on the way that you look. Unfortunately, it's the world that we live in. Sometimes people are superficial. Uh, so with something that can easily make or break you getting an interview, I think it's super important to put that out there and make it more personal by having a photo. I have heard, however, with certain recruiting companies that they will automatically decline any resumes or cover letters that have photos because they don't want them to be judgmental based on the way that you look. So it's kind of a catch-22. It's hard to say should you go one way or another, but I think if you're in direct communication with a physician office and you're not going through a big recruiting firm, that this could be something that actually goes in your favor. And if you are going to do a photo, put a professional photo, be in your scrubs, be in a white coat, look nice. Don't do something that's just straight off your cell phone. You can go on Groupon, find something cheap for like $30, go get some headshots at JCPenney, have a friend that's a professional photographer, do some snaps for you. Maybe your school offers something, um, a graduation photo, something that's really going to make you look like you have a professional appearance, not maybe a candid photo that you took at your white coat ceremony. So it really does need to come off as professional if you do decide to go that route. Um, so I think it's a really personal decision on whether or not you choose to include a headshot on your cover letter or your resume. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, yeah, and I have some questions too. Sure. So would you agree that for pre-PAs, they should also try to stick to one page? I think it's not a bad idea. Um, I think oftentimes, like I said, people are too focused on, uh, they think more uh, looks better, and that's not the case. People don't want to have to dig through uh, elaborate or creative words to find what did you actually do here. Keeping it simple and to the point directs the reader, gets them to the point, and that's all they really want to see. Uh, we're not trying to read a creative writing paper in this type of situation. I think you need to save the language for your personal statement and not for your resume. Well, and like you said, it's a snapshot. It's not the details, um, so I think that's a good point. Um, what are your thoughts on these new fancy resumes? Have you seen those where yeah, they're really cool? There's a lot of like graphic design ones. And so yeah. people are asking questions, you know, should I do something that's creative or should I not? We're traditional. I really think that traditional is the way to go. I don't know if the creative ones really fit our career path. I think yeah. that a creative design resume that's done by like a graphic designer and looks very fancy can has its place, but not in medicine necessarily. So say if you were applying for a job at Google as a graphic designer or Facebook, like something like this, where it's really important if you're do doing a social media job to maybe have something that makes your resume stand out as far as the way that it looks design wise, then definitely, of course, I think that is the time and place to do that. But in medicine, I don't know if that is the best move necessarily, but there are some that uh, only do it maybe up at the top with your name in like a fancy font. But otherwise, I would leave the resume to a more traditional format just to keep it simple. Do you have any favorite fonts for resumes? Times New Roman. <laughs> <laughs> keep it real simple. No um, comic sans. Golden, italics. Um, you can do different font sizes of the same font that will help it stand out more. And I think making good usage of the positioning of the words, the types of bullet points you're using, or line and spacing makes a big difference more so than the font. Okay. Um, can you, and you may go over this briefly later, but if you do, let me know. Um, can you differentiate a CV and a resume? I actually don't go over that in this presentation, but okay. I learn a lot more about that recently, especially I recently ran for Southern Regional Director, and I believe they wanted something that was more of a CV format than a resume format. And I think the best way to explain the difference is the CV is almost like if you did write that really elaborate resume that has everything you've ever done in this like elongated format, that would be a CV. And I think that okay. there's a place for CVs and there's a place for resumes. And when you're applying to jobs or you're applying to PA school, I think you want more of a resume and not a CV format. If you're applying to like a position in academia or a research company, something like this, that might be a place for a CV or you're going to want to write out all the research you've done or all the CME events you've attended and hours you've collected in conferences you've gone to that's important for positions like that but I think when you're just looking for a job the doctor that's looking to hire you doesn't care about your CEU hours or your CME hours or what conferences that you've attended that stuff is kind of irrelevant and takes up space on a page that you could put more important information 
Okay, that's a good, I've never really honestly understood the difference, but that makes sense. So thank you for that. Um, and so headshots, um, you know, I've heard of people requesting a headshot for a job or even at interviews having to have their picture made. Yeah, I think and, when I applied to school, I was asked for a headshot for uh, Western or Loma Linda. Yeah, I had to send in headshots. I sent in headshots for the schools I applied to, and when I got there, they took a picture of me um, for the interview. And so I, I don't – I think it's to help them know <laughs> what you look like. Yeah, and remember, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing or um, – but like you said, I mean, it is kind of just our culture. We're judged on appearance, unfortunately. Um, and you have and, to tell yourself, especially if you're looking yeah. into something in aesthetics or dermatology where you have a lot of face to face with your patients yeah. who look at you and feel like, you know, you're able to give them the services that they're coming for. Because like when I go to get my makeup done, if the person doing my makeup doesn't have good makeup, I'm a little sitting there in my chair kind of like, you know, how's my makeup going to turn out? Right. So I think those situations where it can be really important. And even if you never use it on your cover letter or you wherever in your, you're going to use it at some point in your career. If you apply to the hospital, the hospital, when they're going through your privileges and they want to put you on the badge, they're going to ask you for a headshot or a photo. You can send it in there, or you can create business cards when you're looking for jobs or you just want to network and meet with people, make your own business cards, put your headshot on there with your information. When you go to your association dinners locally, or you're at a conference or an event, bring those cards with you, hand them out to people. They'll be really impressed by it. I think it's something that people aren't utilizing often enough. And there's definitely a place for it, whether it's on your social media accounts or you create a website or a blog. Uh, there's always going to be a place for your professional headshot. Yeah, and that's um, – we had them done at the end of PA school because for Georgia, you have to submit a headshot for your license. Um, or maybe everybody does for, for licensing. I feel like that was something. But anyway, um, so we had to have one done. And then – um, most recently, this was cool at the SDPA conference. They had a professional ph photographer set up to do headshots. And that was really, really neat. And you got two that were edited for free. Yeah. Um, I a conference locally in Florida. I believe that they hired somebody to do that to help raise money for the association and because yeah. of people. Um, so there's, I think it's becoming a thing. I think yeah. we'll see more of it, especially in an type like a time and place where we have things like uh, tinder and bumble and although this is in a dating environment we're very much in that age where we want something quick we want something fast and that first impression is your photo and so people are kind of used to that and i think we're creating this culture where having that one photo is becoming a thing and it comes down to the fact that as pas i think we have to gain the respect of our patients and part of that is you need to look somewhat nice and professional and put together. Um, whereas doctors have this inherent respect with their profession. Um, my dad made a comment the other day, this might be controversial, but he was like, all the PAs I see look pretty. He was like, even the guys look nice. What is this? They're all, all the PAs are nice looking. And I was like, yeah, dad. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that too. <laughs> yeah, me too. All right. Um, I think that is all of my comments. Okay. Uh, so moving on to the next slide. Again, I talk about PDF because I really want to stress the importance of sending that. Like making the mistake of sending a Word document can make or break you getting a job. If your resume comes through all jumbled, somebody's not going to sit there and try to figure it out. And they may not even email you back to let you know that it came through that way. They're just going to pass it on and move on to the next one because they don't have time. So don't make that simple mistake. Always make sure that you're saving your resume as a PDF and then sending it out as a PDF and keeping the Word document as something that's personal to yourself for editing. Um, just to add to that, this is not difficult to do. All you do is that's the next slide. Oh, I just want to mention that this, that's not a difficult thing to do. I think people don't know how to do that, which is, is, it's really easy. All you do in your Word document when you save it is there's a little option to choose save as PDF. You do not need special software. Like it is literally, yeah, we will show you. It is so easy to do. Um, yeah, or you can, yeah, save as PDF. You go to print, like, and if you, if there's any questions, Google it. Like it. It's not hard, so this is not something fancy. Um, yeah, different ways that you can, can do yeah, that. Save so, as PDF, yeah. I just showed you, hopefully. You can do it in Word, you can do it in Pages. Yeah. It is not hard. Nope. So okay. 
objectives and summary statements. Do you need it? I would say that this is really optional. I think a lot of people try to put this in there again as one of those like fluff items. They think it makes their resume look better, but oftentimes the statement that they're putting there has no value. It has no meaning. Like new graduate physician assistant seeking position in an office that provides a great educational environment. Like these are just phrases. They don't have meaning. It doesn't matter. The sentence being there or not being there isn't going to make or break you getting a job. And I think that you're wasting anywhere from one to three lines of space on a one page resume where you really need to be putting on there the important information. So that's something that can easily be eliminated to give you more space if you're struggling on chopping down your resume. Um, so times you should consider that. Again, I think there's special situations where when you're no longer a new graduate or you're no longer a pre-PA, um, where you're changing specialties or you are changing professions or maybe you are a stay-at-home mom and now you're moving back into your career as a PA and you have to kind of explain these different situations. You know, why are you going from clinical practice to now wanting to teach in the school? Or why are you an attorney that left law to become a PA? Um, I mean, there's a lot of different situations where there's time and place for that, but just being a new graduate and looking for a job, I think is a waste of space. So let's see. This is gonna let me. There we go. Education. So uh, it's important, obviously, as a new graduate, to list where you went to PA school, or if you're a pre-PA, you want to talk about where you went to school for undergraduate, or maybe you have another degree that's a master's degree or a PhD and something else. And putting those on there, you want to list the degree and when you graduated. Controversially, I will say that there are situations where I have suggested to people that they actually don't put when they've graduated, and this would more so apply to special situations. Uh, like recently, I had somebody who technically would be like a new graduate, but she graduated PA school in 2014 and never clinically practiced. She had some personal issues at home and with her health and is just now in 2019 deciding to go back out there. She finally passed her pants. She didn't even take her pants after she graduated. She took it this year. She passed it and now she wants to practice. And you got to ask yourself at that point, if you put on there that you graduated in 2014 and you have no work experience between then and now, and somebody sees the state, they're going to ask you questions about what happened or somebody that went to medical school and then they failed their exams and then they ended up going into PA school, but this was a long time ago. Do you want to put the dates on there? Do you want to date yourself? So you got to look at your situation and determine if putting the date on there is something that you want to highlight. And I think there's situations where it's okay to highlight that. And I think there's situations where it doesn't really matter. So you kind of got to pick and choose and maybe work with a professional resume writer or company to go over with you, your situation, and really ultimately determine, is this going to hurt you getting job interviews? Um, then listing anywhere else that you obtain degrees, we talk about that. Uh, where should you put this in your resume? It could be at the top. It could be at the bottom. I think it's personal preference. Uh, a lot of people will put it at the very, very top, and then some people will list it a little bit lower, and I don't think it makes or breaks one way or another. It's just about preference and where you think it looks aesthetically pleasing on your resume. So here's some examples of what that looks like. See here, it's all like legible fonts and it's got bolding and italics that kind of take the same font and make it look a little different in certain areas, which I think looks really nice. So these are different ways that someone could organize their education. Now on here, this particular one, and I think you can see my mouse, mm -hmm. it says GPA 3.72. Uh, another question are, should I put my GPA on there? My answer to that is no, unless you got a 4.0. Nobody cares what your GPA is when you're looking for jobs. I've never been asked, what is your GPA or what was your rank in the class? Really, nobody cares. So I think unless you got just straight 4.0s, this is really irrelevant information that's taken yourself by putting something on there if you aren't as competitive as somebody else who maybe said something. Now all of a sudden they're judging you on that. So I say just leave it off. It's not crucial to anything at all. Healthcare experience. Uh, let's see here. So as a new graduate, you may have not had a lot of healthcare experience other than your clinical rotations. So oftentimes people don't really have anything to put on their resume because all they did was their clinical rotations. They maybe didn't have a lot of healthcare jobs prior to school. And honestly, I'll say, what did you do prior to school? Because we may not even need to put it on your resume at all. If you were the front desk girl in a medical office, I don't want that on your resume. I only want to know about your relevant clinical experience as a PA. 
And there are some previous clinical experiences that will be important to put on your resume because it will help you as a PA. Like maybe you were an EMT or a phlebotomist. Um, maybe even medical assistant, you could say, would be applicable to that because that shows that you have skills that you're going to be able to use in the workplace that other people may not be able to do. So as an EMT, you have ACLS and all these other things that might be applicable to urgent cares, emergency medicine. As a phlebotomist, maybe you're working in a hormone replacement therapy or an IV bag lounge type of place and they want you to start IVs or draw blood. This is going to be a good skill for you. Now, although there are medical assistants that may do this, there's going to be times where you could have to do this too. So this could be something important to an employer. Um, then, like I said, if you were the waitress at Hooters or you were the rock star girl, I don't think that you should be putting that on your resume. Um, like I said, if it's really not relevant to you being a PA or even there are some things in medicine that I would say you could take off that are not relevant to you starting your career as a PA, we should admit those and save space on your resume for things that are more important. Um, then clinical rotations, when you are putting them on your resume, how much information about your clinical rotation do you want to put on there? I've seen paragraphs for each clinical rotation, the descriptions of what they did and the skills. And, uh, but the thing is when you're describing what you're doing, like did histories and physicals, did soap notes, did discharge summary to me as a PA, when you're graduating, those are skills that we are assuming that you already know how to do. So I don't think that it's necessary for you to put those things there. If you do want to highlight your skills, I say make a completely separate section, label it skills, and put the types of things that you feel confident doing on your own without assistance, but I would not list those under clinical rotations. Your clinical rotations section really only needs to show what were the clinical rotations that you did, maybe how long they were, even that's not completely necessary, um, location, supervising physician, so internal medicine, Dr. Smith, West Palm Beach, Florida. That's it. I don't think you need to put any details about what you did in your clinical rotation because this is kind of like a bomb drop to some people. Despite the fact you were in your clinical rotations for four to six weeks, at the end of the day, that's not real clinical experience. And the doctor is still going to consider you brand spanking new despite the fact that you were in your clinical rotation for a month or two. You are still new. The skills that you learned are not adequate enough to really give you any leg up on anybody else in any particular specialty. So don't come out thinking, oh, I did three dermatology electives. Now all of a sudden I should get more pay in dermatology or have a leg up on these other people because I did three months or however many months in derm. They don't care. Uh, everybody does their clinical rotations. It just needs to be there. So the length of time is really not super relevant, but some people will put it on. I don't know if you have any comments on that. Um, no, I think I don't. Um, yeah, no, none of my questions are about that. Okay. <laughs> so this is an example of the way somebody organized their clinical rotations and how basic and simple this is. They're not going into a description about everything they did on a day-to-day -day basis. They just talk about how long they were in them or like the type of rotation that it was. And this can be organized in so many different ways. So I did include mine on my application. And one thing that I did because I was working or because I was applying for jobs where I went to school, I did include the physician's name or where it was because a lot of the doctors knew each other. And so for me, that was, that was relevant for me. If I had been applying in Texas, it wouldn't have mattered at all. But because I kind of wanted them to go, oh, well, she was with so-and-so for four weeks. Let me call and see how she was. It made sense for me to add that. Yeah, I agree. I had several situations where I applied to jobs locally and I did put doctors' names on there. And in my interview, they said, oh, I know doctors so-and-so. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes in a, such a small community, these people do know each other and they will talk to each other. Um, so you got to decide, like, how was your clinical rotation? Do you want that person reaching out to them? Um, yeah. So something to think about, but it can help, especially if they know each other, because a lot of times everything's all about who you know. Yep. So what additional information should you include? So like I talked, something that you would consider that is a skill that you have that you feel confident doing on your own without assistance. And this is not assumed skills like taking histories and physicals, writing soap notes, diagnosing and treating various illnesses. If you cannot do this when you graduate as a PA, there's a real problem. We're talking about putting things on there like I can start IVs, I can do an IND, Foley placement and management advanced suturing techniques, uh, different things like this, starting different lines, uh, intubation, things that are going to set you apart from other people that may not have had those experiences or don't feel comfortable doing those things on their own. 
So uh, I talk about tailoring skills to the desired job position. If you're dead set on being in a particular specialty, maybe you want to make sure that the skills you're listing are specific to that specialty, or at least if you have a general resume, but you're gearing it towards one thing or another, move the list around. Put the skills at the top of the list that are geared towards a specialty that you're trying to go into. So if I want to do dermatology, I might organize my list in such a way where I'm putting biopsies or cryotherapy, things like that, dermoscopy at the top of my list. And then I'll list everything else that might be related more so to other specialties as I go through that. Because we really want to guide the reader and kind of play the psychological game of making them feel like you're very qualified for this position. So if all they read is like the top three skills and they really just skim through the rest, it's very important that we make an impression at those top three. Um, I guess one more thing I'll point out here. I don't know what program all of the schools use, but we did use a special program at my school where we were able to type in all the things we observed or did as we went through our rotations. And whatever program that is that your school uses, you can generally get a copy of that report that will show the number of times you did a certain skill or the number of times you observed something. And that documentation will be very helpful for you, not just when you're writing your resume, but as you move through your career, because I've actually had hospitals ask me for proof that I've done certain procedures. And the only time that I did things over and over again for some of these things were in school. And so I actually had to give them that printout that showed, hey, I've done cryotherapy 300 times or whatever it was. So you should give me the privileges to do this. And you got to fight for your privileges. And that's a good way to show and document that you did do something a certain amount of times. Uh, so get that form or whatever the printout from your school before you leave and it's too late and keep it somewhere handy because it's going to help you in different situations and you never know when you're going to need it. Um, so I do show here an example of documenting different skills and I highlight on here that these are assumed skills. Um, I would not put these things under there. Surgery, suturing, I would probably reword that a little bit and say like surgical first assist, advanced suturing. Um, blood draws is fine. Uh, so different things that, like I said, are something that you may be able to do that other people may not, because every PA should be able to take a history, perform focused physical exams, diagnose and treatment and illnesses. So those things can be omitted. What additional information should you include? Certifications and licensure. This should be a completely separate section. Uh, in this section, you definitely want to put every state license that you have, a DEA license, other things that people are looking for. Uh, are you certified in ACLS or do you have PALS? Do you have BLS? Those things are important. If you were a phlebotomist, if you were an EMT, uh, maybe you were an esthetician in the past and you're applying to something in a med spa, things like this can help you. And this is where you want to put that. Um, other things that people are saying, you know, what's going to help set me apart? What's something else I can put here? A lot of people don't think, or a lot of people are also not aware of DOT certification. If you are really interested in going into urgent care, you can take a course online from home to get your DOT certification to see patients through the Department of Transportation so that you can certify them to drive trucks or different things like this with the Department of um, Transportation. So uh, that's something that will set you apart and help you generally land jobs in an urgent care setting and some internal and family medicines will have you see DOT patients and you'll need to be certified in that. I don't know if you know of any other certifications that might be helpful for people. Um, not particularly, but okay, question about certifications. Would you say still include it if it's expired or you never used it? Those are questions I get. So if somebody took an EMT course, but then ended up working as a patient care tech and never really worked as an EMT, should they put that on there? I'd leave it off because I'll ask questions to why you didn't do something or what happened here. And uh, I think just, just leave it off. If you didn't do anything with it, you're just going to have to own it and leave it off. So Yeah. Okay. I, I agree. And then if it's expired, like if you were an EMT 10 years ago, would you? Yeah, me too. Okay. Well, Same page. Yeah. Good. Do you think that's beneficial? Yeah. Do you think it's beneficial or matters for people to be, have memberships in their state societies and AAPA and all that? I think it's beneficial for people to be part of their uh, membership for their state and through the AAPA as far as supporting our profession because a lot of people don't understand that the reason we're actually not making a lot of movement with legislation and we aren't scaling things as quickly as the nurse practitioners are for two reasons. Number one, we don't have enough in numbers and number two, we don't have enough money. Uh, 
So we need more power in numbers and we need more power in money. And the only way to do that is to get more members in our association so that we have uh, the strong arm to really be able to fight these things. Because to get people to lobby and go and push legislation, at the end of the day, we have to have money. And we don't really have the funds that we need to be moving at the pace that we need to be moving right now, where nurse practitioners have the entire nursing lobby, which we don't have. So they have the support of all of the RNs and we're just us. So if you actually looked at the numbers, we are very minuscule in the large picture of things in comparison to them. And so we have a long way to go with that. But um, that's something too, where if your resume is spilling over to a second page and you really don't know what can I remove off of here so I can get that down to one page, take off your membership and your awards because you're, being a member of something or having an award or getting a scholarship for something is not going to make or break you getting an interview or a job. And that's a section that can be removed if you don't have enough space. But if you do, then absolutely put it on there. Um, but going back to being an EMT 10 years ago, I wouldn't put it on there, but it's a good talking point in an interview to build rapport with the person that's talking to you and talk about your previous experiences. And I like to use the example of like going on dates, right? So think of interviewing like speed dating, and this is your moment to make an impression with people. And so we don't want to show all of our cards on our resume and give them all that information. You don't want to be the girl with all the baggage that spills everything, right? So when you go on your date and you finally get your date and you show up, that's the time where we can talk about things that we didn't put on the resume or go into more detail about what were the specifics of what you did on your clinical rotations or what did you do in your different jobs. I wouldn't necessarily spill the beans on the resume with that. I'd keep that as talking points during your interview to engage the interviewer and to build rapport. That's good. Yeah. I talk about it being speed dating or dating when I talk about interviews too. So. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Let's see. Um, actually, one thing I didn't point out on here is uh, EMRs. So that's electronic medical record systems. Mm -hmm. um, I think that this is becoming more important oh. as we move along and maybe it wasn't important so important 10 years ago, but now it really is. Um, I think if you have room on your resume to put a separate section that shows every single EMR system that you utilize during your clinical rotations or that you're familiar with, and again, I'm now speaking to uh, new graduate PAs, not so much pre-PAs, uh, but those that are new graduates that have experience with different EMRs, putting this on there can give you a leg up because that tells the hospital or the doctor that they don't have to train you in that EMR. You're going to be turnkey, ready to go when you get into your job because you already know how to use that system. Um, so definitely keep track as you're going through your rotations of what EMRs are you using in the different offices and hospitals and different settings so that you can add that on your resume or just keep there as something uh, to let people know that this is almost like a skill that you have. You know how to use these different systems and you're ready to go. So uh, this is an example of additional information. This is how somebody uh, organized their professional memberships. Here's an example of EMR experience. Certifications. Um, I've actually recently, when I edit resumes, been combining these to one line instead of three separate lines. And again, it's all about aesthetics. How much room do I have on your one page? If I have room on one page to do it in three separate lines like this, I'm going to. But if I'm trying to save room, I'm actually going to put certified in BLS slash ACLS slash PALS. And then maybe I'll put valid through um, or I'll just say current and put it all on one line because it doesn't really need to be three separate lines. Awards. So again, if you have space for it and you uh, can put it on there, here's some examples of some awards maybe some people would like to include, but this is a section I think that'd be completely omitted and not affect you one way or another with getting a job. But this is absolutely something you want to have if we're talking about a CV. Because again, like I said, a CV is a lot more elaborate, a lot more detailed, and generally for more positions like something in academia or research, or if you are running for a position for AAPA or your state organization or something like that, we're going to want to know about your awards and honors. But if you're applying for a job, this isn't relevant. Same thing, actually, I believe, with volunteer experience. Volunteer experience is something that people like to include, but you can completely omit it from your resume when you're looking to apply for jobs. But this is going to be something that's really good when you want to create a CV because people want to see that you're involved with your community. References. So people have asked me, should I put references on my resume? My answer to that is no. <laughs> so 
Um, again, we only have so much space to put on there. Typically, if somebody wants references, they're going to ask you for references, and then you'll be able to provide it to them. If you're trying to save space on your resume, this is something that does not need to be on there. If you really want to put something on there, then you have space maybe at the bottom references upon request, but this is just a fluff statement that really isn't doing anything except just aesthetically doing something or taking up a placeholder. Um, some people will list three references at the bottom if they really want to, but again, I would maybe not do this until it's requested. Um, but when you do get to the point of needing to provide references, it's important to think about who is going to provide a good reference for you. Think back to your clinical preceptors. Who did you have a good relationship with? Think back to your instructors or your colleagues that you ended up doing your rotations with and really think about who's going to give you a good reference if they were to give you a call and not just who's going to give you a good reference, but who's going to reply quickly because a lot of times people will be waiting for your references for you to start your job or for you to get on staff at the hospital. And so if these are not people who are going to respond quickly, then you may not want to use them. Um, I like to think of people that I can literally text or call and say, hey, this company is going to be reaching out to you because I've applied for a job with them. Please keep an eye out for an email from them or a phone call from them. And then I'm able to follow up with them and say, hey, did you get this yet? And then I call the hospital or the person, oh, they said, we haven't heard back from this person yet. And then I'll reach out to them. Hey, they said they sent this. Can you check your junk mail? So being able to be in contact with whoever your references are to get things expedited and moving quickly will be really beneficial in the job and hospital credentialing process. Um, Moving on, special considerations. Um, I've met so many different people through my company, Advanced Practice Provider Solutions, that have been in really unique situations. Um, a couple of people have previously been medical students or did actually graduate and work as doctors, and things happened in their life that led them to actually go to PA school. Um, I've met people who actually own businesses, and they're the ones that hire the doctors, and they're looking to sell their practice and then go back into practicing as a PA. Um, I've even met somebody who was a PA and then she was a stay at home mom for many years. And then she went back and became a professional chef and published cookbooks and went on TV. And now she wants to, you know, combine her healthcare experience with her love for nutrition and really share that with her patients. And so that was really neat to uh, show this thing that was going on with her and try to come up with a way where we could connect the two and make it seem applicable to going back in the workforce and getting her a job. So all these are really difficult and technical situations where I think that talking with somebody or a professional can be helpful because again, if you were previously a medical student or a doctor and then you became a PA, this might raise red flags. This could have people want to ask questions and this could hurt you. So we really have to decide how do we want your resume to look how do we want to organize things? What information are we including or excluding so that you're still landing the interview and not knocking yourself out the door? Uh, so if you have an outstanding circumstance, whatever that is, if you're an immigrant from another country and then you came over here, whatever the situation is, this is maybe something that I would call a special consideration that you should talk with somebody about so that if you are experiencing issues with getting jobs, there may be a reason for that, and it could just be how we organize your resume so that the reader isn't focusing on certain things. And this is where cover letters are uh, very paramount uh, in utilization here. Uh, this can explain your story and really get you in the door. Any questions? Okay, a couple questions. So, first of all, like the templates in Word for resumes, people should use them or they should not? You know, I've never even looked at them. Uh, I just kind of like have templates that I like to use that like change depending on uh, the situation. Um, I'm sure there's some templates there that are probably pretty good. I would have to click around and really look at them and see okay. if there's anything there I can work with. Uh, but I, when I create resumes for people, I actually kind of custom tailor it and I try to make them all look a little bit different. Uh, otherwise you get a bunch of resumes coming across the table that look very similar in nature, but I do try to add Instead of just words, whether it's like a creative line or a special bullet points or something, so that it's got something more than just black and white. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, what is your advice for people who are concerned that they just don't have enough on their on their resume? Um, should they try to add fluff things to make it a page or just 
accept that it is what it is. I think it is what it is. I wouldn't add the, what, what are you going to add? Creative words? Uh, so all you're doing yeah. is distracting the reader from the point. And so if all you do is distract, and then at the end of the day, if somebody really does sit down and say, wow, all this has no meaning, and this person's only done this, um, I wouldn't try to be deceiving about it. I would be straight into the point. I think there's nothing wrong with not having this big elaborate resume and it's okay. Everybody starts at the beginning at some point, right? So we're all new graduates and we all come from different backgrounds in different places and PA jobs are in high demand right now. Uh, I mean, recently I know Forbes voted us number one. So we have a lot of growth happening. We're definitely in need right now. So I don't think that not having enough is something that people really need to worry about. You're gonna find something. Um, and just like we talk about how it's like speed dating, uh, you got to think about when you apply to jobs and you're getting denied, every job isn't going to be for you. Just like when you're dating, every person isn't for you, but you're going to find your people and you're going to drive with some people and not with others. And that's okay. Um, and so I think that it's just a matter of like finding your place and finding people who want to work with you. Cause that means if somebody's calling you in for an interview and you don't have a lot of experience, they like you, right? They're interested. So they've expressed interest in you and you don't want to force that by adding things on your resume. All right. One last question. Should people add anything about social media on their app, on their resume? So, you know, that's a thing now and LinkedIn. No. Yeah, okay. I think yes. Um, professional websites like that, probably. I don't know what other ones exist really. Uh, now that could be again, a special consideration. Let's say you contacted me, I'm doing your resume and you have a really large social media presence. You have a very large Instagram with thousands of followers. You have a podcast, you have a really popular blog. Uh, you've published books. This is probably not something I would be omitting from my resume. This is really important. And the other thing is, is if you are somebody who's an influencer and you do have a large following, this is really important in jobs like dermatology, aesthetics. A lot of the people actually want you to have a large following so that when you post things, you're helping them build clientele. Um, or it may be really important that a doctor knows and you kind of tell them about this because they know may not want to engage in a relationship with you because they don't really want to have everything all out there or they don't like the fact that you're kind of all out there and publicly all over the place. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but again, this is like a relationship. It's got to work for both people. And if that's something that doesn't work for them and this is something that you're doing and you're passionate about, it's not going to be a good relationship. So I think it's really important to disclose just so that you don't have issues down the line and so that the doctor is aware of what you're doing so they don't one day find you online somewhere talking about something and they say, hey, this is a conflict of interest. You can't be talking about these things. You could potentially get fired. So uh, it's really important to disclose these types of things to employers so that there's no conflicts of interest and uh, that they do know that you're doing this and they allow you to continue doing it. Okay, cool. But just like would I post my Facebook page? Probably not. I mean, mine's personal. I don't have like crazy followers or anything. So there would be no need for me to post my Facebook page, but I have heard of people who actually go on uh, the internet and they'll Google your name and they'll look up your Facebook and they want to see what type of dirt that they can find. So you do need to be conscious about what photos you're choosing, what's public, what's private, what are you posting on? Like even if your Facebook is private and you post things on public forums, say you're on Facebook and you're part of PAC professionals group or physician assistant group or these groups, any of these groups that can be publicly viewed by other people, it doesn't matter whether or not your profile is private. I can search your name and I can see everything that you've ever said or posted about the PA career or questions that you've had or you fighting with people online. So you have to be really conscious about what you're doing on social media and what type of impression you want to give other people by what you're posting. Yeah, that's great.